What's up? This is Rebel Radio. What up? What up? This is DJ Newmark. This is Peanut Butter Wolf. It's your boy. It's okay. Keep checking out Rebel Radio. Rebel Radio. This is Rebel Radio. We're in the place right here. Uh-huh. Rebel Radio is going down. Would you say Rebel Radio? Oh, wait. Let's do it again. Rebel Radio. What up? What up? Welcome back to Rebel Radio. Happy anniversary to you, our listener. Thanks for hanging in with us. If you've been with us from the beginning, and thanks for finding us here if you're brand new. Hopefully the second year will be almost as good. We're going to set the expectation a little lower and just say we're going to we're gonna try to not disappoint you too much in our second year. Hey, check it out. My guest today is Claude Von Stroke, chief something or other of Dirty Bird Records, founder of Dirty Bird Records, uh, the Dirty Bird barbecue the dirty bird camp out basically anything that starts with dirty bird this man is behind all that he's got some incredible stories for us about failing over and over until you get it right uh he started out in the movie business had a couple attempts at being a dj and then finally he figured it out which is why he's here today um and he gives us some some good lessons about just doing it and figuring out the details later and how he stays in sync with his community. The thing about Dirty Bird fans is that they are hardcore and he's, he rides right along with them. And now let's hear from Claude Von Stroke. Well, thanks for having us, man. I appreciate yeah. having us in, the, in the, uh, the lab where it all happens. You're welcome. Thank you. Dirty Bird Ground Zero. Very cool, Absolutely. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you because I, I've, I've been watching your career from afar, and and enjoying the music and and really you know seeing everything that you're doing from the barbecue to the camp out to really this this whole lifestyle experience that you're creating for people is just really interesting. Thank you. So I'm excited to learn more about it. All right. Cool. How'd you how'd you get started? How'd you were you always into music? Yeah, I was always into music. Uh, what was your first? I like, played the cello. Oh, yeah? My parents took me into a music shop and said I could pick any instrument. At what age? At like nine or something. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that was the one that I could get a tune out of. Okay. I just thought it was the easiest. You picked it. So you're like looking around, you just see this big ass. I, didn't, I don't know what I was thinking because that... It's bigger than you at nine just years like old. Annoying. Yeah. That instrument, I didn't love it by the end. Let's just say that. <laughs> How long was that? I played it for 14 years. Oh, wow. Uh, it's a long time to not love it. Well, I just did it. Like, my parents are like, you have to play an instrument that there's no negotiating it. Yeah. So that was my instrument. Yeah. I mean, it sounds great, and I liked it a little bit, but once I heard the radio and like what was going on yeah i wanted immediately to get into that like what there was no information what's the song that did that i heard like all the first hip-hop stuff Uh we when we moved i grew i was born in cleveland but then we moved to detroit area like the suburbs when i was maybe 11. Mm -hmm. i was already listening to the radio all the time before that when we moved to Detroit, the stations were a little more wide open, like sure. free format. You could hear a lot different. You could hear techno. Yeah. And you could hear hip hop. Yeah. Like, and so I was hearing all this old, like, Africa Bambata and Fat Boys and Run DMC and mm-hmm. Roxanne, Shantae, and UTFO, yeah. Dini, all this stuff cool. on the radio. And, uh, so I immediately wanted to figure out how that was getting made, mm-hmm. and there was no information. It was just right. The world was devoid of information, so we just tried to figure it out ourselves. My friend Jamie and I, uh, we would like overdub on jam boxes. Then I, we figured out. We, then we found out what a four-track recorder was, mm-hmm. which recorded four tracks on a cassette. Mm-hmm. Saved up and got one of those. Then we found out about samplers. But still, it's just all like sound on sound. Yeah. You have no idea what any of the articles mean. Right. <laughs> like, we're just... So, and how old is this? 
How old are you? This is like 12. Oh, wow. 13 years old. Yeah. And, and you're I'm already like, making rap tapes. And yeah. Did you have a rapper? I was a rapper. Oh, you were rapping too. Yeah. I made a rap album in high school. Nice. <laughs> and I sold it door to door. I made oh, yeah. $800. Under what name? Barkley MC, which are my initials. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's great. Super. Right. You know. Yeah. That's how it happens. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because, like, you know, now we think of rap, we think of, like, this underground, you know, obviously now it's mainstream and all that, but, yeah. but we think of that time as being real underground. But, you know, for those of us that were there, like, the radio played such an important role. Yeah. And I grew up in San Francisco, radio. and it was the same thing. Like, we're listening to that stuff. The thing is, is it wasn't on the radio in every city. Right. So I never heard any of that in Cleveland. Yeah. It was just certain radio shows in Detroit where I was sure. like, wow, this is, actually exists. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you gave up the cello then? No, I mean, I still played the cello that whole time. Yeah. All the way through that. Yeah. And then, uh, it's a long road, actually. There's a lot of stories. Did you, um, were you, were you thinking about DJing at that time or when, uh, when did that happen? So I didn't even know what that was and no one knew how to scratch and no one knew, like I'd scratch on my dad's like audio yep. file turntable yep. and you'd just be super pissed and it didn't work. Either. Right. Like it's a belt driven. Yeah, it doesn't. Like you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh. So no one could figure that out. No, there was no information about that either. You basically had to live in like Brooklyn, New York to know anything mm -hmm. just from word of mouth or just sure. go to something and see something. But I, I was like too young to even get yeah. let out of the house. Yeah. So I never picked up on that DJing stuff until high school. Mm. Uh, we had a tiny little radio station, so I got a show, and cool. that was fun, but it was just like, play a record, talk, play a record, talk, play right. a record, talk. Then I did the same in college, but then our radio station in college got shut down because it was interfering with 911 frequency. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And it got immediately shut down for the rest of college. Yeah. I had a show for two years, and then it was gone. So I actually just kind of like did something else. I didn't just find another way to get into it. Yeah. I just studied. I think I, I started getting good grades. And oh, stuff. wow. And were you, so were you still Barkley MC at this point? Like, we uh, I don't know. I had like, I had another alias true site. I can't right. remember exactly. No, I'm sorry. But what I mean is like, were you still rapping and making no. those records? When I got to college, I went to like a really, Cold, miserable. Co it was a good school, uh -huh. University of Rochester in okay. upstate New York, but it yeah. was cold and miserable. Sounds cool. And right when I got there, I realized that if I was going to rap, it was going to be like a novelty act at a fraternity party. Yeah. And I hated that. Yeah. And I actually just said, I'm just going to skip it for like yeah. a couple of years. Like, this is not going to be the way it happens here. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to just be like the guy that raps. When everyone's drunk. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I got turned off to it, really. I still did the show, but... Yeah. It was a weird time. It was like... There was probably some race stuff involved. Like, I now that I look back, I was probably just not really, like... There's no place for me, mm. really. Like, mm -hmm. white rapper... At University of Rochester, <laughs> there's not really like sure. a spot for me to live, exist. Yeah, in anybody's like friend circle. Right. And that, so that I didn't do it. And what, then, uh, what year is that? Like 1992. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't. Like, it wasn't a. There wasn't a spot for a white rapper most places. Right. There weren't really any. There were a couple. Yeah. Third base. Sure. That's about <laughs> it. Uh. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't. After that, I got. I don't know. There was a guy at my school, Nigel Richards, who mm -hmm. was a big techno DJ in Philadelphia. But again, I had no idea what he was doing. He'd play me things, and I'd be like, "People listen to this," 
And he's like, right. yeah, we have these huge parties. Yeah. And da, da 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 And he was like a great businessman. He had a t-shirt company. He was going all over. But I still was like, I have no idea what he's doing. I've never been to any of his parties. Right. They're not replicating it in Rochester. It's just in Philadelphia where he lives. Mm -hmm. So I didn't catch on then either. It took me a while to catch on to anything. I was way behind yeah. the loop. Were you thinking that music was a career at this point? No. Or what were you going to do? I was a film major and I wanted to be like a screenwriter or an editor or director, or some kind of film job. Yeah. So I actually just drove to Venice Beach straight from University of Rochester, which was the, it was, I didn't even stop at home. Uh -huh. It was so cold there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I drove to like Pacific in Venice and I rented an apartment and it was like awesome. $500 a month. Yeah. It was still kind of dodgy in Venice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, that blows my mind. That's not that long. I mean, it's a long time ago. <laughs> no, I mean, but it's changed. It's right. Been, it's definitely so different now. not 500 a month anymore. Yeah. The Pacific in Venice. Yeah, no kidding. So I'm like four blocks off the beach, trying to get a job in the film industry. My mm -hmm. first job was, well, I had like the normal things that you go through where you have no idea what you're doing, where you're like selling fake perfume out of the back of a car for one of those like scams. Awesome. <laughs> that lasted a couple of days. That's cool. Then I got an internship for Lee Daniels. Okay. But he wasn't Lee Daniels yet. Yeah. He was still like grinding. Yeah. And I worked in that office for probably half a year for free. They're, they're actually great. Like Lee Daniels yeah. was super professional. I mean, he would scream and go crazy and stuff, but yeah. when he taught screaming. me how to answer the phone yeah. correctly. Like it was military, like you yeah. have to answer the phone like, and sound professional, be mm -hmm. professional. You have to look professional when you come to work. So I picked up some good habits there, and yeah. then I got a job at Paramount being a page okay. from that. Yeah. And I just did that because Lee Daniels was free, and this was right. paid. Yeah. And then the pages also do tours. Uh -huh. So I learned how to be a tour guide. I can't even believe I had that job. <laughs> I, could have, I must have been the worst tour guide. <laughs> But most of the people on the tours were like from France and Japan. Yeah. They have no idea what you're talking about anyway. Right. So you could just say anything on the tour and you could get away with it. It's great. Uh, so I did that and then I would just go around the lot. From that, the page, I mean, I'm telling you like in depth, the page program satellites out to other departments when they're mm -hmm. missing people. Right. So I got into the stock room. Okay. And they liked me immediately because I was big and I could like carry reams of paper upstairs and there yeah. weren't like a lot of elevators at Paramount at that time. There's yeah. a lot of old buildings from the old studio days. Uh -huh. So I got a cart and I could k take reams of paper and like messages and whatever, boxes from the stockroom to all the different production places mm -hmm. and offices. So I, that was actually the best job I ever had in L.A., because I was just riding around in a cart yeah. with sunglasses in, in the sunshine around a movie studio, like picking people up, giving That's them cool. rides, talking to people. It was pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> now that I think back of sure. all the jobs, that was the most fun. So then I just took my resume to all the film productions yeah. and then I got on a film. Nice. Then I worked on like three, four films. They were all like super bad movies. Uh -huh. They are all like $90 million movies. I was a PA and I drove the director to work. And uh -huh. then, I, then I would play them my music and then I got some music in a movie. Oh, really? And then it got pulled at the last second. This is like a whole progression, Yeah. which was like heartbreaking. And then I'm like, forget it. I've been PA for like three years. I'm not, I'm not what the, what's the greatest possible thing that can happen to me? I become third assistant director, second mm -hmm. assistant director. Like, this is not going to be, this is not for me. Right. So I went back to Detroit. So before we go back to Detroit, you know, think collectively about that, <clears throat> that experience. 
Were there lessons there that you yeah, used so I, today? I thought I the lesson one of them was that uh, I pretty much failed at the music end of it and yeah. the movie end of it. I just wasn't like I was a kid. Like mm -hmm. I didn't know how. To, if I went back, I could crush it. <laughs> like I wouldn't have been a PA for more than six weeks if I right. went back now. Yeah. Just the things you don't know when you don't know them. Yeah. It's like impossible. Uh, but yeah, I had first I had kind of had a pattern forming of making a bunch of music that I thought was really good and then not being able to get it out mm -hmm. or not or not getting to the where it was supposed like getting on the movie and then pulled sure. out fail like making something great and then failing and so I actually went to back to Detroit on a movie I got mm. a job on a movie where I was locationed so I it wasn't just like I just moved back to Detroit I right. stayed in the movies and I moved back to Detroit <clears throat> But this guy that I met in Detroit started taking me to the real like warehouse raves and stuff. Mm -hmm. His name's Anthony. We're still like best friends. And cool. He then I really saw like what was possible as a DJ, like to make a room go off or yeah, and have it be really underground and cool and fun. Who are the DJs? And that's at? basically the first time I'd ever really seen that. I had just been out to a bunch of bullshit right. before. Yeah. I, I was into Chemical Brothers and like, I didn't know anything. Not, not <laughs> I like Chemical Brothers, but right. I'm saying, if it wasn't at Virgin Records, right. I didn't know about it. Yeah, yeah, sure. If it wasn't like on KCRW, I had yeah. no idea what it was. Mm -hmm. So. who Who is a, can you think of a, show out there that like yeah all the, the DJs at that time were like Mike Servito Derek Pless like go DJ Bone mm -hmm. uh Dot who was running his name his party name was Poor Boy mm -hmm. those were his events um Brian Gillespie uh Stacy Pullen okay. like all, all they're like it was kind of a it's kind of like a local, even smaller locals were super popular. Right. Then like the traditional Derek May. Yeah. That stuff was still like over here. These were like really underground parties. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but they were really fun. Yeah. And then when did you first get on? So then I started making music again because yeah. it was inspiring and my rent was like $500 a month again. <laughs> But I, I could work on a TV in Detroit. The PAs get paid really well right. or whatever, the assistants or whatever you do. Yeah. Assistant producer, you can make $500 a day, mm -hmm. which at that time, if your rent is $500, your you only have to work two days a week right. or two days a month yeah, <laughs> to like good. cover your expenses. Yeah. So I would work like two or three days a week on TV commercials after this movie ended. And that would be enough. Mm -hmm. And then I would make music, and somebody played me a drum and bass mixtape during that, and then I really got into that, you, which tape? was also bad timing. Why is because that? Because no one listened to drum and bass in Detroit. Right. Nobody. Yeah, sure. So I was in the wrong city techno. again. Yeah. But I was making genre a genre that no one cared about. So then I started playing. Whose tape did you hear? Uh, this guy, uh, Mike Hainer, just made me a mixtape. That was like Ed Rush and Optical and all this like oh, super okay. weird dark stuff. Yeah. Before it got super hard, it was kind of moody. Mm -hmm. Uh. But I had really never heard that before, and it was like from another planet, and I was super excited about it. Yeah. So then I went through like this whole thing of making a drum and bass album in Detroit. <laughs> Okay. DJing it live. No one cares. Uh, but I was, I didn't care. I was so you into it, it that I was like, I'm doing it. Yeah. Then I lost that whole album on a hard drive crash. And that was like another huge blow where yeah. I was just like, fuck, forget it. I'm not doing it. It's over. So I had like a two or three, maybe more than three or four. Like I was just like, forget it. Yeah. Every time one of these major things happens, I take like six months to a year and I don't do any music. Wow. 
and then I just can't resist getting back into it. Nice. That's kind of the theme of what happened. And then I, uh, yeah, just, I ended up moving to San Francisco and mm. then I'm still was not going to do music and I met, but I was still really into drum and bass and San Francisco was the right city for drum and bass. Yeah. But I couldn't get in. Mm -hmm. So I made another project. I tried to get into that click and it was like all doors are shut. It's like if you were trying to get into Dirty Bird. Right. <laughs> we were very tight. Yeah. And I could see it being difficult. Yeah. But I was like the guy on the outside getting into their thing and I could not break it. And it was also very evident to me that I wasn't learning f uh, from a club standpoint. Mm -hmm. So I was making music at my house, mm -hmm. but I wasn't learning the club side of it properly. So yeah. like my demo was just like all over the place, super crazy, 500 patches, shifting times and like no one could, no one would play it. Right. Do you, know, do you see what I'm yeah. saying? But you weren't seeing that. I didn't catch, I, I figured it out after that one, after mm -hmm. that project, I made like a five track CD and I tried to get it. And then, then they're like, they actually gave me feedback. There were, there were some nice people. I didn't want to hear it, but they were like, yeah, it sounds cool, but nobody's going to play this because of these reasons. Yeah. Like it's not a d club music. Mm -hmm. It's just like cool music. So that was actually a really good lesson. I don't remember who gave me that feedback. But I didn't get into that drum and bass group. Probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. And really, that drum and bass thing started to disintegrate because no girls were going to it anymore. By the time it, it was just getting to that down, I, I remember thing of those like parties. super technical, yeah. really hard, and then the, just the whole female population just said, "Forget it. It's yeah. all bros." Yeah. So then the Martin brothers, who I had met, were super in the house. Mm -hmm. And we started to kind of come to a, like, a, I don't know what you say, like a compromise or like a, like, look what I'm into, look at what I'm into. These things work together yeah. to make a sound that's not vocal house. It's not either one, yeah. And it's not traditional house, but it's somewhere in here. So what attracted you guys to each other? I worked so on different. a... My mom actually made this happen because she, my mom was super gregarious uh -huh. personality. And she, right when I moved to San Francisco, she met another mom in a shop and her son was doing video work. And I was an editor, assistant editor at a post-production shop. So they, the moms made us get together. And this kid's name was Seth. And Christian Martin worked at his company and they had just made like their own company because somebody gave them 50 grand to make the first all flash music video oh, over wow. flash. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and it was uh, <laughs> dice raw of the roots okay. on MCA and they made the whole video in flash Wow! and then realized that no computer could play it yeah. because it was impossible sure. to play it back. So we had to export every frame back into an Avid and resync it back up to the music and then just make a video that yeah. they could play, which is kind of like, yeah, kind so of. so you loses. made a flash video, but we have to play it on right. videotape to yeah. watch it. <laughs> That's great. So it just looked like animation. Uh -huh. So whatever for that. But that's how I met Chris. Yeah who also liked drum and bass and I just liked his personality. And so I just started becoming friends with Chris. And then he told me about his brother, Justin, who had just started making house music like three weeks before that. Oh, wow. And then I started going to the bar where Justin bartended and just talking about it. And I was making a documentary out of the back of this post-production house where I would, because I had failed so many times, I've, Learn. I finally learned my lesson, and I said, I'm just going to literally ask everyone what the deal is, uh -huh. like how they did it, and yeah. what, what is the deal. So I interviewed 50 DJs whenever they would come through San Francisco, 
and I went down to Miami and I would use the equipment out of the post house or get shooters from Craigslist. I didn't even own a camera, mm -hmm. but I directed this whole thing where I had Paul Van Dyke and Juan Atkins and Orbital yeah. 50 acts on a project all telling you how to how they made it, what they did, how to run a label, how to DJ, blah, blah, like all so technical cool. stuff. And what was the what was the most helpful stuff to come out of that? For me personally, mm -hmm. it was a few interviews where it they were they like Derek Carter and Theo Parrish were like you you just have to live you have to live it if you want to be it kind mm. of kind of interview like if you want to be a DJ then you should find out everything about it you should go work the door mm -hmm. you should flyer you should make mixtapes you should be in everybody's ear you should go to the record shop every week you should talk to everyone you have to like be you just have to live it you have to do it yeah so that was great really advice. great advice and just at that same time, I was starting to realize that it was important to have a group instead of just, I'd always gone on it like nobody knows what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. My mom doesn't know what I'm doing. Nobody knows what I'm doing. I'm just doing it. Yeah. And then you get no feedback and then you end up with a project that everyone's like, well, well yeah, that's cool, but <laughs> right. what am I going to do with this? Yeah. <laughs> instead <laughs> of like getting feedback, working off people, trying to one up each other yeah. and coming up with something that actually works for everyone that everybody, it's like a group effort, mm -hmm. even though it's a solo thing. Mm -hmm. That was something else I got out of it. So did you know you were going to create a label at that point or? So I was, I became Justin Martin's manager when okay. he got signed it. We were taking his demos down to Miami mm -hmm. And his brother handed it to Ben Watt, and Ben Watt called him like t two weeks later or something and said they wanted to sign it. And I literally just talked to every DJ in the world. I knew, I knew a lot yeah. of information. Yeah. And I had edited their interviews for four hours apiece. I was just like a wealth of information about what to do. Yeah. So I said, I'll just, I'll manage this for you and I'll look after you and make sure this goes through okay. Cause Justin's not super business oriented. Mm -hmm. And so I did that. And then I started working with Ben Watt out of it and mm -hmm. bringing him to town and like co-promote. He, he had this like thing where he only wanted to play for promoters that he trusted a hundred percent to like bring him into the right space. Sure. He's like kind of high maintenance yeah. type personality where he needs to know it's going to be the right club in the right city. So we knew because we were going out and we knew everything about mm -hmm. San Francisco. I was like, why don't you just have us, we'll work with the promoter from the club, but we'll bring you into the right club. Yeah. And so we started doing that. And then I would have Justin open every time. So it was actually Justin that gave me the, the like whatever hubris to like think that I could do it. Mm hmm. So he had a track and I'm like, Justin made, started making music eight, eight or 10 months ago and he has a track out and I have been making music for 20 years. Yeah. I can probably do it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened. Yeah. And then, and, and then what was the first thing you put out? That I remixed really his connected. first record that we released on Dirty Bird. I did the okay. remix. And I hadn't even thought of Claude Von Stroke name yet. So if yeah. you actually go back to DB001, it's Barclay Crenshaw uh -huh. remix. It's not Claude Von Stroke yet. Yeah. Until DB03. Okay. Why'd you decide you needed a stage name? It, it just happened. We were out and uh, we were just all messed up and we started thinking of fake minimal techno DJ names, mm -hmm. international DJ names. So everyone had to think of like their name if they're from Germany or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then that name just popped out and it just made everyone laugh. And the 
there were these girls that we were with, and one of them had a birthday the next week, and I was DJing at this tiny bar called the Tunnel Top. Mm -hmm. And she printed this huge flyer, and it said Nicole's birthday featuring Claude Von Stroke, and she put my name in huge letters. That's hilarious. And then that it was almost like they did it. Yeah. The people like that I was hanging out with made it yeah. a thing. Yeah. And so I had just finished the Deep Throat record, and I was like, ever, ever since we said this name, it's like nonstop people just say it. So I'm just like, I'm just gonna put that name on the record, mm -hmm. and that that was it. Like that totally worked. That record yeah. did. That was my first record. Right. And it did amazing. Yeah. And then um, it was probably my 500th record. Right. It was my first release. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um. So, and then all of a sudden you're a label, and you have. Yeah, then we got, we, so one of the things I had learned from making the documentary thing was that I had to save up enough money to make it through five records. Mm. And that was why all these little labels kept collapsing in San right. Francisco because they didn't know that distributors never pay. Yeah. So I had saved up enough because my wife was working on this like child's toy company leapfrog mm -hmm. and they and i knew everything about filmmaking so they would do prototype toys and then have a four-year-old kid come in and play with it nice and we would shoot it doing them playing with it and i would charge them like ten thousand dollars <laughs> just for the shoot wow. but then the killer was that i made this monstrosity VHS duplication thing in my in my uh -huh. bedroom. <laughs> oh, no way. Where I could copy 12 VHSs yeah. at once, and then I would charge them like eight bucks a VHS, right. and it would cost me like 40 cents. Yeah. So I just, and then they would ship them to all the shopping malls, so I would just crush them on the VHSs. Uh -huh. So I saved up $25,000 to start Dirty Bird. <laughs> nice. Because my wife just got me these like windfall jobs. Yeah. And then that was pretty, and she also said if I really focused, she would give me a year where she paid the rent because she had the job at LeapFrog, right. so she was doing great. Wow. So it was a really perfect mm -hmm. timing of everything. Yeah. And it just worked. Yeah. That's cool. And so, you know, cut to now, Dirty Bird's a label, but it's also you know, the series of events with the yeah. barbecue. Yeah, so we started as a label, and it was really, I never really thought that it would be more than a label, mm -hmm. which is kind of short-sighted, actually, but it just grow, grew and grew and grew, and things just started to become more and more obvious, like, oh, duh, we should sell T-shirts. Right. But they should be good. Yeah. And like we should make nice stuff instead of crappy stuff. And yeah. <laughs> like uh, some of that is like the different management houses I've been through. And like I've been through shops where like I see how things operate and I pick up things and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but the, the whole industry shifted towards events over the last. 10 years like, right. since we started it was record sales you could sell records and make money mm -hmm. and then it really sh you would actually did not get huge dj fees it was records and then like okay dj fees and then it just was like no records huge dj fees yeah and uh that shift made us realize that we had to do events as well so we kind of just repackaged what we had already done for free in Golden Gate Park and mm -hmm. it got booted out because no they permits. couldn't sustain it. No yeah. permits. And then we took that on the road and then that kind of led into the camp out idea. Mm -hmm. Was that last year was the first year? Yeah. Yeah. And then the camp out really worked and so... So what, what's camp out? Camp Out is uh, a three-day festival that's pretty much all Dirty Bird and a few guests. Yeah, but it's like summer camp when mm -hmm. you're a kid. So there, all the games are actual games, and there's teams. You get a color when you show up. Oh wow! There's four color teams. Yeah, and there's a winner at the end, and there's a scavenger hunt, and there's archery, and there's boat races, and there's balloon tosses, and art projects, and mm -hmm. yoga, and whatever. It's kind of fun. 
That's cool. And so it's fun enough so that you can either listen to music or you can go to the talent show or the comedy show mm -hmm. or see the Fungineers or something else. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that you can always be doing. Yeah. Or you can be at the main, there's only one stage of music and then it shifts to like a little late night area, but mm -hmm. there's not competing music, but there are competing activities. Yeah. So, so talk about, you know, I mean, to me, that says something so different about what Dirty Bird is and what you are that, yeah. you know, you would create that because typically, you know, a label event or festival is like, it's just music. Right. Right. Well, the other, that's kind of, it usually is just music. The, the main thing about this festival that is beyond all of that, what I just said, music and games. Mm-hmm. It's the only festival that I've ever been to, and I've been to like every festival. Of course. Where I would say 75% of the artists are just out mm -hmm. in the crowd, mm -hmm. just doing the games and yeah. hanging out and like eating lunch. And they're not in the artist area and they're not showing up an hour before they're set. Right. They're just in the camp out. Yeah. They're camping out with the people. So was it. <laughs> Was there a, uh, did you have some insight that that's what fans wanted? No. Or? In fact, it was completely like I just manifested this thing from zero. It was, it was kind of, I took a risk. Yeah. Last year I just said, I'm doing this camp out. And we had some people trying to help us, like trying to, get into one of the bigger companies, but then I realized that, you know, if we do it that way, the music's gonna be off at 11.30. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna be what we wanted. And so I didn't have a partner. I wanted to partner with the Do Lab. Yeah. They were not available. So I just made a flyer that said, Dirty Bird Camp Out, all your favorite DJs in the world. And it just had a picture of like a beautiful background. Not even having, I had no location, I had no partner. I had no idea how I was gonna do it. And then I just posted it online. And it got more hits than like any post in the history of our label times right. like 20. Yeah. I think like in an hour it had like 400,000 hits or some crazy, crazy amount. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, whoa, it's gonna, it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Because I posted it, even all my booking agents, everyone was like, oh, did you just post that? <laughs> did you just post that you're having a festival? Right. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I'm doing it. And so uh, because of that, because I posted it, I could have just listened to everyone and not posted it. Right. But because I posted it, right in the same time, Do Lab had something fall apart. So they saw it mm -hmm. and they called me and they said, "We just became free. Do you are you do you what are you doing? What is wow. this?" Yeah. And I'm like, "Oh, that's perfect because I don't have any way to do this <laughs> festival." <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably thinking they missed the boat. Right. On it. And I said, do you guys want to do it? Because yeah. that would be great. Yeah. I, you were who I wanted to do it anyway. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And so like two weeks later, after we just went through the negotiations, we were doing it. And yeah. it, that was June. And the festival was in October. Wow. So we just like threw it together. Yeah. So how do you decide, obviously, you know, like do lab how do you decide what are the right partners with your brand well in that particular case i had been to a lot of do lab events so i knew 100 percent what they were i mean i don't know 100 percent, but i knew what right. they were about and like yeah. how they would it it's not that i wouldn't go with certain partners mm -hmm. it's that some partners are would be way less work mm -hmm if you know what I mean like yeah so I knew if we went with do lab we're already 75% to where we need to be just by having them yeah where if I went with someone who doesn't really know anything about what we're doing and doesn't do those kind of like 
more touchy feely events that it would be a lot of work on our end. We would it would be a little bit sure. way it would be excruciating to try try to convince the promoter that we had to have games and that people would actually do the games. Even when we had do lab, no one knew if, we were, if anyone was going to do the games. No one had any idea. Yeah. We were just 100% winging it. We had to kind of push on that end of it. And then, thank God, people played the games. <laughs> but they all played the games. It yeah. was incredible. What, um, so do you approach all of your partnerships that way? We don't have that many par partnerships, but yes, yeah. the woman that's now running our events company is someone that does the right kind of party that I know because I play for her all the time, and mm -hmm. and she gets it. Yeah, she knows how to do it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, um, I will also say that AM only has been super helpful and supportive, and like really able to get us there mm -hmm. in a lot of ways it's not always like hey we're just gonna do a party we need help yeah from everyone yeah sure and do you work do you, do you involve sponsors in the stuff you do no in the barbecue it's crazy we don't have any sponsors <laughs> okay we have void did they hook us up every year we do we do a nice deal with void and mm -hmm. they're like a sponsor but they're not it's not free right so, I don't know. We might have a sponsor this year, but we still haven't even heard back. But you want sponsors. But honestly, we don't have any sponsors, right. really. Last year, we did Mike's Hard Lemonade for a couple. Cool. But that, it was, a, I'm not going to, whatever. I can't get into that. No, it's fine. I'm just curious how you. Yeah, we um, would like to have a sponsor how, because it, a sponsor isn't really. The sponsor has to be the right kind of sponsor. They're they're not invasive, right? And like branding everywhere with signs, that was one of the nicest things about camp out. It's just like it just looks like a camp. And there's mm -hmm. not a bunch of crap everywhere. And the sponsor would have to be able to be have a small footprint like that. But the reason that we want a sponsor is not like what you would think. It's like it's because it's so tight mm. on events. It's just, if you can get a sponsor, you just get like a, a little breathe, breathing room yeah. to where you're like, everything isn't like, we have to fight over this DJ's $1,000. Sure. It's like, oh, we can just like do the party. <laughs> do yeah. you know what I mean? Sure. Like we don't have to be crazy over the art costs right. and all that. Yeah, absolutely. Same time, I mean, it feels like you're very protective of the brand. And, yeah. you know, I get the sense that your fans are, you know, I've read some stuff about that, you know, you guys make dance music for like an older generation. That um, might be true. I don't know if that's. I don't know. I, f have I see that in mind when you create that. I see that. it flipping over every year. It's yeah. crazy. It's, it may be, but. I just see it like it's turning over constantly. Yeah. I don't see the same people at every show that I saw three years ago. Okay. There are almost none of the original San Francisco fans still left at the San Francisco party. Right. Because they're all like Yeah, people old. grow up. <laughs> like <Yeah>. me. <laughs> right. Some, there's, some, there's some troopers sure. still around like from the original crew. Right. But I was going to say, like, I get the sense, you know, that you, that there is a, a community. Yeah. I mean, our parties around. are 21 and up for the most part. Yeah. And it sucks for some people. I get it. But it makes a more, I would even say safer, mm -hmm. relaxed, like everyone's not going to try to kill each other party yeah <laughs> like there's at 21 and up with our sound it's there's not like 50 kids jumping over the fence getting impaled right maybe one a year right we had one last year wow <laughs> yeah no that that's interesting yeah 
And so, and how tight are you with fans? Like, are you really tight? Yeah. I know a lot of fans. Like, I, I had, a, I started up a program that's kind of sputtered out, but I'm reinstigating it called the Downstroke, where I yeah. try to meet with fans before the shows. It's kind of tough to because it takes a lot of organization. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm bringing that back, and I like knowing who the fans are, especially the really dedicated fans, because they're really powerful. How do you mean? They just, they're able to spread the message way easier than we can. Like, we can just do our social media and, like, try to talk about it as much as I can, but it's right. really, like... The people on the ground in certain cities have such an influence over how things go. Yeah. If you know 50 people in Toronto and they're like the right 50 people, it's going to be amazing. Yeah. But you can't just be like, oh, they're just going to come anyway. <laughs> so, but, you know, 50 people probably wouldn't have told you to do the camp out. I'll, I'll, probably 50 people told me not to do it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. So how do you? So that's my question: is how do you balance, right? That that connection to fans and the feedback you get from them. Oh, the fans all told me to do it. They did. Oh yeah, the okay. fans are like, you should do another one. Really? That's how I know it's gonna work. Yeah. That's how I know this year's camp out is gonna be amazing because every single town that I go to, they're like, yeah. to camp. They're either like I went and it was amazing, yeah. or I can't believe I didn't go because this guy went and yeah. told me about it. And is that through social or is that face to face? That's like word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah, that's just them talking to me. Up that's cool. At the shows. Yeah. I'm really confident about this year's camp camp out, and then we're gonna try to grow it again next year. We'll see what happens. Maybe second location. Yeah. That's so cool. And then I saw there's a, a subscription. Right. So we were a part of Drip FM, uh -huh. which is that same concept. Yeah. It's a subscription service for anyone who wants to be on our label. But yeah. they were going to close. And one of our Drip members said, do you want me to just recode this for you? And we're like, yeah, right. Man. And they did it in like three days. Wow. <laughs> and so that was just super lucky. Yeah. But then Drip didn't close, but we were all like, we were like, well, we already recoded it. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, sorry. We That's go. cool. But Drip was amazing. Those guys are awesome. The yeah. ghostly guys. Uh, but since we did it ourselves, we can do make it a little more tuned to exactly what we want to do. We could, so when you're in someone else's service, it, uh, you can't, it's like you have a request. Right. But unless the other... 75 labels are dying yeah. for it it's not going to happen yeah so we're able to do some stuff ourselves like in what? here like so one thing i was trying to get into drip was to water make a water market tracks because mm -hmm. there's always like two members from some russian file sharing thing that mm -hmm. just pay six dollars a month and then it's everywhere right all you have to do is watermark the file and then they're banned. And right. then you're like, good to go. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. we could not get that through. Oh, wow. Uh, we can, I want to be able to add more, like, tutorial content, like, and ways to do ticketing that are more integrated into the actual service than just, like, email us mm -hmm. and we'll make, mm -hmm. put you on the list. Just, it's going to, uh, maybe we'll get it onto the phone. Just mm -hmm. things, like, that are just more tailored to our specific thing. Yeah, that's so cool. And since it's a kind of a closed circuit, we can do bootlegs and things, and it's not really like no one right. cares. Yeah, it's like five hundred people. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so they get in, super into it. It's great, but I, you know, I think, I mean, obviously there's drip, and there's starting to be more of that stuff. But the band you know, camp just right. announced their thing. Yeah, but it's so you know. I think it's not obvious to a lot of people in your position why it makes sense to do something like that for 500 people. Yeah, it's really great. And the, one of the main things that took us a while to get into our thing was the commenting. Yeah. Because that's where we see people interacting right. the most. 
and we couldn't get that in, out on the beta and it just started like two weeks ago we got the commenting thing up mm -hmm. that is great because then you can just go in and be like do people like this record people talk to each other they interact it's like a mini social network mm -hmm. yeah and those 500 people are really into it i'm sure and if yeah. if we can get it to like 2000 then maybe the record label will make money <laughs> <laughs> who knows well we were talking about that earlier right, right. that the, the 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 money is not in in right. the label right it's not in selling music um that's true and so so how does that affect you know you said you know it's interesting because you don't have to like make a song worried about how much it's going to sell Right. But how does that affect the creative process then? The creative process in making a song? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I make music to get played in the club, so I want club DJs to play the music. Mm -hmm. So I am making it in that respect. But I'm not necessarily making it to be number one. Right. Does that make sense? Sure. It's actually more valuable to have a track that everyone plays that's not number one, in my opinion. Like, uh, there's just like a guy that has a track out right now. It probably didn't even go above 25 on B port, mm -hmm. but everybody's chatting about this guy because well, all I just it's like people know when something's going on. It doesn't have to be in the charts. Mm -hmm. It's just like people are like, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And once you hear somebody say, did you hear that? Right. Five times, you're like, that guy is going to have a good year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, okay. So you're 10 years in now with the label. 11. 11. It's a major accomplishment. Thanks. Um, what's the next level? Uh, I don't know. I think it, so looking from the outside, it might look like we're really together, but I think that it's always, there's always some stuff we could be fixing. Okay. So it's just about fixing everything and getting it to all be super functional. So for example, the next thing I would say, every department we have should be its own entity like with its own profit and loss right now it's like three people running seven companies right but i think the merch should be like its own company yes there's a person at the top that's like are you guys doing the right thing but it should be its own entity the event should be its own entity because unless you do that there's no you're just running a bunch of stuff at like 40%. Right. Do you, and that's kind of the way I feel it is right now. So <laughs> it's doing fine, but okay. I think that we could, that we're being a little bit short-sighted and not actually, like it's, it's risky because if you hire someone to run each one of those companies, you can be bankrupt sure. in a year yeah. if they don't make money. But if you hire someone to run them and they all double, then you're doing amazing. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we should be doing the latter. Like, it's just that it's a conversation. We have, to, it's risky. So, yeah. and we can't just be like, we're just throwing our money around all the time. Yeah. So how do you make decisions like that? You're the boss. Right? I'm the but boss, have, but my wife is have... actually the, the head manager of everyone. Okay. So... It has to kind of be a collaboration decision between us mm -hmm. if it's going to be like hiring a new person. Mm -hmm. But there's some things that are so obvious, like the merch. I right. feel like it just needs to have pop-up shops all the time and just have someone be running it. Yeah. These are like internal conversations we have every day. Yeah. Events. Yeah, these are things that we just, there's a, you only have a certain amount of time and we can only dedicate 30% of our time to events, you know? So mm -hmm. that's how much it gets. Right. Yeah. So what is that team 
Like what? 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 What would I hear you say over and over again? What do you mean? If I were part of the Dirty Bird team. <laughs> Execution is everything. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Everybody has tons of awesome ideas, and yeah. it's all about how you execute the idea. Like that's really, that's really it. Because mm -hmm. the idea, everyone loves coming up with it. This is something from way back, from all the conversations, from the very first thing that I was telling you about. If the execution doesn't work, it's like you get the idea, you execute it, and then you don't follow through with getting right. it to the people. It never happened. Yeah. You make the album, but you don't give it to the marketing guy. Sure. It doesn't come out. Right. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so are you, are there mentors now that help you? Uh, I have a conversation where Jesse Rose and I, who's like in the guest house right now. Okay. We chat all the time. Yeah. Because it's good to have somebody that you can just bounce the ideas off of. There's a bunch of people that I talk to a lot. I am managing myself at this point. And I, I'm just kind of, I'm the kind of artist that I've, I've took me a long time to figure out that that's what I need to be doing and that I just really need to make the decisions and then have the execution team and not have the manager mm -hmm. then me then their execution team. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Cuz I can get 7 times as much done if I own the execution team mm -hmm. cuz it's just straight from me to them we do it. Right. There's no like the one bad part about that is that you don't get that little extra look like from outside the box of like, maybe you should do this. Mm -hmm. So that's why I try to talk to people like Jesse and other DJs and have conversations that are not just in our little compound. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's difficult though to figure it all out. Sure. Of course. Yeah. Um, well, we'll let you get back to work in a minute. I have a couple of final questions. Um, you know, you talk about these failures that got you, you know, to each point and, uh, you know, your willingness to keep going yeah. in the face of that, which obviously is really important. Um, you know, I think most people just kind of give up and go, finish college or whatever, right. right? Like that kind of thing. Um, but so, you know, the stakes are higher now with family, with a yeah. company and, you know. But it's easier now. Yeah. The beginning is the hardest. Like the one, the breakthrough project was that documentary thing that I made where I said, it, there was a point where I just said, I'm finishing this, even if I have to break up with my girlfriend, go into debt, borrow money from everyone I know, eat dog food, whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm finishing this project. And that was the first time where I had actually just said, that is what's going to happen. And I followed all the way through to distribution. And it came out, and that was the change. Mm -hmm. That was like the change in my life where... I worked so hard that everyone hated me by the end of it, but I did it. Like it was done and it was over yeah. and it just flipped. Everything just flipped at that time. And I was like, I can do it instead of like, I'm just doing it and hopefully someone likes it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can do it. I just flipped my mind after that project. And I think that that part, everything up to that was harder than everything now. Mm. Now I feel like I can do it. Like yeah. if we can think of it, we can do it. Maybe it maybe some ideas don't work, but we can do whatever we want and I'm sitting in my house making music and I don't have to ask anybody if it's the right kind of music and I don't have to talk to an executive to find out if we're doing the right decision at the label and it's like I don't know how you can get better than that. <laughs> like it's not that bad. 
Totally. It, everything before was way harder. Yeah. It's like just grinding. I'm still grinding, but it's a different kind of grinding. Yeah. It's grinding with confidence. I like that. <laughs> That's cool. What a great insight. Um, do you have a favorite DJ? Uh, I really like Gaslamp Killer. He's like, he, he's the most entertaining to watch for me. Nice. He's awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Well, what's, um, what's, let's promote what's going on with the label. What's coming up next? Uh, the next thing is, uh, is an anniversary package of Who's Afraid of Detroit. We're releasing it in Detroit. Mm -hmm. It's like a full Detroit thing. It's got Octave One. I did a remix. Uh, Mark Hool from Windsor. It's only right across the river. And, uh, oh my God, Vision Quest. Okay. Oh, those three guys are from Detroit. And then the artist that did the art is from Michigan. The, the director is the guy that I went to the raves with. Anthony, oh, wow. And he's like a big Ford car commercial director now yeah. and all that stuff. He did the music video. We have a pop-up shop at the festival for all three days. We're having a party. Then Green Velvet and I are closing on Monday as Get Real. Nice. So it's like a whole... That's a, that's one of the lessons that I've learned. Just make a package out of everything. Like, yeah. just don't go and play. If you can make a huge, like, tie everything into one thing, do a t-shirt, blah, blah, blah. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. what we're doing. That's our next big thing. Love it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thanks Thank for doing you. this with us, man. I sure. appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, come back anytime you want to. My son's been just, like, standing behind them. you going, like, what are you going to be doing? Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right that's a wrap that was claude von stroke i hope you enjoyed that like i did join us next week for a very special i, I say everything is very special i hope you notice that but uh, i'm not gonna tell you who it is but but i love this guy and his he's the head of one of my favorite brands we'll leave it at that you'll have to come back and find out in the meantime hit us on twitter at rebel radio net Send us a birthday shout out for our one year birthday. We'll uh, send you a picture of a cake. Hit us on Facebook or leave us a, one of those nice five star reviews on iTunes. We appreciate it. See ya.